I guess like Juan from Theo will just introduce briefly and then just I'll, I'll read through a bit of your introduction and then uh, we just get started. Ah, skip that, <laughs> skip that. <laughs> okay, I'll keep it very short. But <laughs> okay, so maybe, okay, so good, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Alejandro García Gadea. I'm a Spanish uh, senior architect at Zaha Hadid Architects. And I would like to thank you all for being here tonight for the closing lecture with Patrick Schumacher. Uh, for this one week workshop, I had the pleasure to lead at CEO University of San Pablo. During this design and research workshop, we have been exploring computational design tectonics through procedural design methodologies and design experimentation. Inspired by the form finding strategies from pioneers of computational design and novel di digital tectonics developed over the last 20 years, students explore strategies for a serpentine pavilion design proposal. If you are interested, we will be sharing everything in uh, social media. And I would like to express my gratitude to Juan Antonio and Marta from CEO for organizing this event. And of course, Patrick Schumacher to support the workshop and accept the invitation to share his experience and knowledge with everyone tonight. I'll pass it now to Juan to say a few words about uh, CEO. And then we'll just like briefly introduce Patrick and we'll get started with the lecture. So good afternoon to everyone. My name is Juan Antonio Fuentes. It's an honor for me to be here representing the CEO University, closing both this incredible and intense workshop and the keynote lecture series. First of all, I would like to thank everyone who attended Paolo Sanchez's lecture um, last weekend, as they were all truly inspiring to us. So I hope you all enjoyed this amazing lecture. And just to finish my intervention, I would like to particularly thank uh, Paolo, Sade, and Patrick for giving us part of your time and always being so generous with us. And I'm really grateful and feel truly honored to be part of this incredible experience. And as Patrick, Alejandro, and Marta knows, after one year, we can now say that we finally made it. <laughs> thank you so much to all for believing in me since the very first moment to, to make this happen. So Patrick, it's a real pleasure, a dream come true, and a privilege having you here. So thank you so much. A pleasure, thank absolutely. Antonio. So, I mean, like we, we all know Patrick, I think it doesn't yeah, need like a, like a very long introduction, but just very briefly, like uh, to, to kind of like go through a bit of like we, the, the, the last two decades. Uh, so Patrick is a principal at Sahadid Architects, as we all know. He joined the practice in 1988, and uh, he was seminal uh, at, the, at developing Sahadid Architects to become what it is today, a 400-strong global uh, architecture and design brand. Patrick studied, uh, maybe some of you might not know, but he studied philosophy, mathematics, and architecture as well. Uh, receiving his diploma in 1990, and he has been since 2000, 2003 a partner and co-author of all the projects of Zaha Hadid. In 2010, also important to mention, he received the Sterling Prize for Excellence in Architecture along uh, with Zaha Hadid for the Maxi in Rome. In 1996, uh, he co-founded Design Research Laboratory at the Architectural Association in London, where he continues to teach. He, Patrick lectures worldwide, and he recently held the John Portman Chair in Architecture at Harvard GSD. Over the last 20 years, he has contributed to over 100 uh, articles uh, to architectural journals. and uh, He coined the famous term parametricism, uh, which he has published uh, in a series of manifesto, uh, like kind of like naming uh, parametricism as the new epochal style of the 21st century. In 2010, 2012, he published his two volumes, theoretical opus magnum, the autopoiesis of architecture, and he's recognized uh, worldwide uh, as one of the most prominent thought leaders within the field of architecture, urbanism, and design. It is for me a great honor to introduce him tonight as a mentor uh, and a source of inspiration in my career. So without further ado, welcome to uh, welcome Patrick tonight. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for that. 
Um, so let me just get straight into it and share my screen. Yeah, let me make sure. Oh, you have to uh, uh, yeah, enable, I'll enable it. Okay, so. Ready. Ah, here we go. Yeah. Is that showing? Okay, let, let me get this going. Yeah, we see your screen now, Patrick. Okay, great. Now we go. Cyberspace and architectural semiology. So, I mean, last year obviously was uh, quite transformative in terms of discovering telecommunications, uh, more pervasive powers, and the way we, uh, our social life has been transferred into the uh, domain of telecommunication, online communication, let's say um, web mediated communication. And uh, so I think we are at the threshold of cyberspace and I show a lot of examples of what's going on. When the internet initially appeared, it was announced as the, pop, you know, cyberspace was already announced. This is 30 years ago, actually in the late eighties. And uh, in the mid nineties in TU Berlin, I did a virtual college cyberspace project. Uh, where the internet at that time was just, you know, you know there wasn't even a widespread um, graphic user interfaces. It was sort of black, white text on black backgrounds mostly. Uh, so, and the vision was already there that this would be, that we would, um, and there's some novels already anticipating that, um, New Romance and others, that we would be, um, entering that kind of matrix of uh, virtual interactions in the virtual space. So, and I think we, it is happening now. And of course, that fact of being uh, locked up and having only virtual windows into the world is, is accelerating this enormously. And there is an enormous amount of startup companies and also investment of the major, major firms, whether it's Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and, and, and many others, Tencent, et cetera. So, um, and of course, the internet has been an important, powerful for, for many years. And also the microelectronic revolution, computation revolution, changed really the civilization, civilization in many ways. And that's also one background of parametricism, of course, and the built environment is changing as well. Um, but also we have, of course, he had an intensification of, uh, interaction face-to-face -face in, in spaces, urban concentration. I mean, this could also be a, a, net, you know, a network of flying around the world and before COVID, and, and we probably get, get back to that too. But anyway, cyberspace is coming. So uh, there are three, these three theses, and I think that more and more of that uh, internet will be driven in through this kind of virtual reality cyberspace experience to be designed by architects. And um, I also think that it will have an influence on the discipline and understanding that we actually, yes, we're working with engineers and contractors, construction and so on very importantly, but our specific task is the ordering of social interactions through a spatial visually kind of language we, 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 we install. And that is the remit or um, core competency, which equally applies to virtual spaces and real spaces as framing social interaction communication. And, um, but my particular thesis three is important that I believe that the moment these worlds are very separate, but I think they will fuse strongly that we will actually the one, you know, that we will design these virtual conferencing spaces, galleries, um, exhibition halls and, and corporate interaction spaces uh, together with the real because all these institutions who hosting these worlds, most of them will also have real world, whether it's you know, venues and for their own interactions or for, for customer interaction. So they will have to be designed together and they will also be come seamless with each other. And that's what I'm gonna talk later. 
Um, so there's an enormous amount of uh, investment pouring in. But I want to emphasize that um, I've been talking about my theory of architecture about, uh, you know, as focusing on social functionality rather than technical functionality, which we, of course, have to integrate. That's the whole idea of tectonism. But we're doing, we're organizing the various situations and interaction potentials, and we make sure that they are visible, conspicuous, uh, phenologically, uh, let's say, transparent to us, and that there is a language which makes these differentiations and codes the social situation differences. So I've been talking about the organizational project, the phenomenological project, and the semiological project as this key, sub, let's say, parts to the architectural project. And that's distinguished from the engineering project, as well as distinguished from the contractors project. Now, architects also get involved with, obviously, um, the contractors project to some extent that we are setting up, you know, working drawings, but less and less. The shop drawings are actually done by the contractors themselves. And we have kind of BIM, BIM models and so on, but which partly specialist services. Why are we still in there? Because we want to control the look and feel and character and let's say artistic expression for the sake of communication of these real physical results. Um, that's why we're in there, but it's not, it's a kind of subsidiary just controlling that our vision is being realized properly. Now I want to now add to what I call the dramaturgical project, which is about in, in the web, it would be interaction design, user experience design. And actually we should have always thought about this as well. And to some extent we recently have, particularly if you talk about also kinetic system, the way doors open, light switches on, uh, how, what's the dram dramaturgy of moving through a space, what do you, the sequence of encountering spaces and how they interact with us and transform us. So I'm adding to that, that's new inspired by, let's say the idea of cyberspace, but maybe should have always been in there. And I think simply that the web will move from a graphic into more spatial, let's say, tool. Um, and so it was actually graphic designers who have been, uh, my, who took over web design basically. And uh, because the, the web was then based on the, on the analogy of the magazine of, you know, with, with, with pages and a lot of text and image. Um, and, we, we, you know, there's a hyper text uh, in the end. Um, but um, by the way, I think we have to recognize graphic designers as colleagues. I mean, I'm looking at all the design disciplines as one universe of discourse, uh, which where we are all in interacting, we are all framing communication. Um, and, 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 there was also, of course, the current web designers, they're framing uh, communication through design, through choice of forms and ordering of the different offerings, color, um, and, but also interaction. How do you feel? What happens when you put scroll your cursor? And to some extent in graphic design, you also have things like, you know, the various styles. Uh, and in the Bauhaus, it was very clear that there's one universe. The Bauhaus had urbanism, architecture, interior design, all the products and furniture and product design, industrial design, as well as uh, fashion, which I'm also including, we, and, and graphic design, of course, typography, etc. So it has been remembered, we as Zadin architects, we have not included so much graphic design I mean, for our own purposes. And we've developed our own kind of typography. I was personally involved in this nice, uh, <laughs> Uh, lettering, which we, which we is a signature lettering from us, but we haven't done that for clients. But we could have and should have. So, so now we, 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 we will be joining uh, web design, but with our spatial expertise. So, and uh, so, <laughs> cyberspace is particularly we're focusing on. I mean, one thing you could focus on um, is fixed information stored information, information retrieval, and that could be spatialized. And initially that was, but also when in particular it involves people coming together, we moving from that magazine to the 3D world condition. A lot of people are trying that. We should try that too. We are uh, actually working on that. Um, particularly because the experience could be more vivid and you can have side communications, you can roam around and it could be easier to, to, to see things happening in the background. There's in the peripheral vision, you, you, you have something and 
And it's, and so I've been trying some of those sites and it is getting to the point where it's workable. And a lot of you guys who are maybe in the world of video gaming, you, you're kind of quite prepared to, to join that. Um, so why am I saying that this is further distilling the um, discipline's core competency? I mean, because the I'm, I've been always saying that really we about the spatial visual ordering of information, but mostly communicative interaction. And uh, in cyberspace, that's all that's really, even you know, it's much more evident because we don't have all the physical constraints and the buildability constraints. I mean, there are other technical engineering constraints which have to do with implementing. And you also have that in the website design, you have the designers who are our colleagues, and then you have the kind of engineers, system engineers and coders who technically transform. It's the same in industrial design. You always have the designer and then you have the, the engineer. That is always parallel. And we have to realize who our colleagues are. Uh, not the, the building engineers, but the, you know, the, the product designers and the uh, graphic designers. And even the graphic designer, when it comes to books and magazines, they have and this is a printing engineers and fabrication concerns. So it's really always the same diagram. But we have to realize that what, what I found interesting, the semantic charge is the very essence of all cyberspaces. So what are called the semantic charge, this idea of a semi-logical project, which I've been emphasizing. So when you develop cyberspace, you realize that you really it's the iconography that you can find the appropriate spaces. You can distinguish its ordering in space, but also which shapes and colors and atmospheres are for what kind of interactions, etc. So, um, so I've been always saying that this is about ordering interaction processes um, and social functionality, and that is usually in real spaces and in cyberspace too, delivered by communicated demarcations. It's not so much physical barriers. I mean, there are still physical barriers and uh, um, fences and locks and so on and walls. There's some degree of that going on, but a lot of the contemporary spaces we are interested in, mixed use complex and inner cities, you can flow through everything and roam around everywhere. Whether it's university campus or Google campus, you roam around everywhere. <laughs> And there's a free, free, uh, you know, coffee bars and, and and so on, and you know the Amazon shops where you just walk in and grab something and move out. I mean, that's the world we're talking about: borderless worlds. Um, and it's mostly about. It's also worlds usually we haven't where we haven't been living all the time. It's like a new places, so we need actually a language we can we can use. Um, anyway, so so framing communicative actions. And that's also framing online interactions. You know, somebody's designed this whole layout and functionality and, and ordering of, of, of Zoom, the front end, the user experience, and that's our colleague. And now we're going to compete with these colleagues uh, and, and doing something. And by the way, there was always in graphic design already deconstructivism to some extent, some parametrism even, and, and the interaction design of Apple, for instance, when you have when you close a folder and the way it swooshes into a point or when you scroll down and these, 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 these icons kind of in swell and deflate, inflate and deflate, that's parametricism. I mean, they have been not fully consistent because they have a minimalist phone designer and the, and the app with the little fillets, grid of app blocks. This is, this is not parametricism, but there is um, a kind of vernacular parametricism in everywhere in the design world including graphic design, interaction design, web design. And I think it could become more um, explicit. So now I have to look, you know, if you look at web design, the key is so-called user interface design or user experience design. What our colleagues are doing, it's basically the surface, the, the final surface of interaction and it's look and feel and what you can do. And that's exactly in the building, the look and feel what we are in charge of the experience, what you can do, whether you can open that door, close it, whether you can switch on that line and hopefully in the future, more, many more kinetic and interactive situations, whether you, whether you can um, you know, shift those furniture around or not. There's, a, there's also a kind of interaction design and that's what I call now dramaturgy. So 
I don't know why I threw that in there, wait a second. Um, and going back to the beginnings of the internet where it didn't exist yet, but Neuromancer William Gibson is this kind of strange world of a, of a virtual matrix you dive into. And everything's kind of strange and other. And for me, quite influential was the book uh, Cyberspace, Michael Benedict. I think it came out in 87 or something. So the internet was in, ab in its absolute infancy. And in a place like Germany, I was teaching in the in Berlin UTU in 90, when I mean, it was still with, with Zaha at the Berlin office um, in 94 uh, five. And, uh, you know, the internet was there, but it was, as I said, white letters on black background. The, I was reading this and it is actually interesting. Uh, it also, in a sense, talks about information design and basically some kind of visual encoding of the different options and situations. And it's kind of iconography. It's a semiological project right there. And um, the centrality of communication becomes more obvious because there's nearly nothing else kind of left um, in, in cyberspace. I mean, it's a communication tool and it's navigation, finding what you might want to participate and then it's the structuring of that situation. And in both, uh, it's information rich environments or information rich, you know, tableaus and pages. So in a graphic design, you, obviously, they, they're trying to make information, give us information. I mean, what, what do you get in a magazine is information. And it's somehow structured with a headline, with a chapterization, there's an order to this and the, and the graphic. You know, fat printing, highlighting, the placement of images and so on. That's information rich environments, but they're 2D. And that's the same formula for architectural design, urban design, information rich to environments in 3D. We have different constraints. In a magazine, you have to find the right ink that it doesn't smear on your fingers. And in architecture, you have to find the kind of right steel and welding so that the, that the, that the, that the building doesn't collapse. But that's, based, that's in the kind of engineering business and both needs to be considered. Um, so, phenomenology, semiology, spatial with the language, these are my things. So, and I've been teaching that for a while, and it's, it's, it's you know, its prevalent prominence and importance becomes clear. But I'm using these kind of things where you say, okay, you have, an, and this is a nice metaphor of an architectural design problem. You have actors, and they're differentiated, maybe two teams, a referee, and you have uh, demarcations in which the, the rules of interactions change different conditions and you just the, 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 the mere graphic thresholds or the mere uh, communicated thresholds are enough to order the social process. And you can also imprint several over top of each other, which is also an interesting condition for architecture. But you, so, so obviously I've been recently also promoting that we should always show our designs populated with the with the actors and interactions, and that bring that shows the societal and social purposes. And you also can see what the meaning is of a space. The meaning of the 16 meter space is that you know the the goalkeeper has more uh, you know um, and more more powers and rights in there and can can intervene. And in the five meter, there's another change of rule. So social protocols keep changing. And that's exactly what happens in architecture and also in this situation down there. And also fashion, you know, we different actors, different participants with different roles, they have either uniforms or with different tricots, different team uniforms. I mean, it's not so strict in real world always, used to be. So fashion is, and is also semiology and it is, functional uh, design work, uh, carrying information and helping and ordering the social process. And um, we now self-select into these roles and we dress up for certain situations. And that is also framing a social and, you know, uh, event and interaction, how you dress up and what's the setting, where do you bring your girlfriend? <laughs> 
what is the message and what's the expected interaction type. So, so the semiological project is interesting. So it's, it's all about making these differences, the different situations, the different characters uh, visible and legible. And then you have a system to play with. And you can see what is important is that we, that we maintain a system of differences and the, there's a lot of freedom on how we articulate the figures here, for instance, and the field, the, 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 the space segments. And uh, there's a lot of creative freedom as long as we maintain a system of differences. It's just a bit of, you know, the logic of a semi-logical system. And um, then we can critique, critique it, how legible is it? So again, so what I'm saying now is we have organization, phenomenology, which is to do with the fact, can you actually perceive the organization? Is it becoming conspicuous? You have to worry about if it becomes complex, can you separate the figure from the background? Are the, the complex relations cognitively tractable? So this Gestalt psychology, this psychology of perception comes in here. And that's what we're testing when, you, when we do drawings, whether we can actually, whether the composition is clear and legible. Semiology is then when we have material coding, color coding, formal coding, you know, that we, that we distinguish the different parts of a mixed use complex and you can see the difference between an office building and the residential building and the hotel and so on. Usually you can see it, the functional requirements in a sense become the index, become the, the, the information carrier, but usually it's an also let's say heightened and made deliberate by the, by the designer who intuitively wants to make these distinctions clear enough. Dramaturgy is this new concept which should have been there maybe all along is, is uh, you know, <laughs> the interaction design. What can you do? Can you walk here actually? Can you move up that staircase? And, uh, you know, can you, can you open those windows or not? Okay, so now the interesting thing is that there's, the, I'm now looking at the project for me is to design virtual worlds, but we're designing, and I'm gonna say this right away, in full integration with the real worlds, these clients would also have and wanted to have design, designed. So, and we, we, we're starting to do, approaching some of our clients, but I'm looking at the, the, the virtual only worlds where, where, where which, which exists like Second Life, and a lot of them are play, they kind of escape from real life to some extent, the entertainment, but they are also have been acquiring some real social functions, even in Second Life. You, there are some people who have given, you know, some universities use Second Life to have lectures and seminars and so on. And also you can really meet people and communicate and maybe, maybe you, you eventually, uh, it, it, you know, become kind of real useful friendship networks. And these are the, the usually, we're talking here is relatively banal and ordinary, just simulating uh, and, and reiterating what, what we know from the real world. And um, there is this strange kind of um, fantasy entertainment world of Horizon, which is a VR world where you can also build things and join as a, as a kind of funny avatar. So that's Facebook, it's full on there. And they obviously also purchased Oculus, so they have the whole headset kind of technology as well. And there is a famous kind of presentation Zuckerberg gave a few years ago, uh, launching um, um, Oculus and this kind of idea of AR overlay, this inter either you work, you, you, you project and meet friends in different situations and you also have <coughs> using kind of real world backgrounds in of commas as, 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 as background screens for that. And if Facebook offices, Zuckerberg's own home and, and then you can do a lot of interesting things. You can use your phone and, and make photos. And I mean, it's, it's, quite, it's quite sophisticated and, and playful. And of course, there's Fortnite, where there are these lobby spaces where you meet your friends before you go into the battle. 
and you can do interact there and they become kind of hangout spaces uh, social spaces i don't know them personally <laughs> And also another thing is that you get economic activity in second life, you have your own currency, so they become kind of parallel worlds. And uh, uh, the same here, or in so-called Decentraland, these are worlds, and they're kind of a commercial ventures as well, where you, where there is a virtual world where you can buy a piece of land and set up shop or build a gallery, build an event space and entice people to come. So there's this kind of city analogy rather than the magazine analogy, very strongly in turn. Of course, you get avatar, and then you, you, <laughs> you know, fashion design, uh, product design, you, 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 you probably build up a whole wardrobe again for different occasions. It's a real interesting, uh, and so, so I'm sure fashion designers will come into that as well. And the Somnium space is that where they get a lot of nightclubs and, and whatever concerts and things like that. Um, and you have in these worlds, you know, fashion shows and building openings, galleries and casinos and many other things. Um, I don't know how great these experiences are. I, I tried some and my students are currently researching that and trying a lot of those. So. But I think it's coming and becoming more comfortable, more easygoing. And so we're working on that. There's Sansa, which is a spin-off of... Um, 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 second life, and there's actually you know some XDRL guys use that to create this kind of world illusor where you can where you can have events and it's 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 you know so parametrism would be the and tectonism even indeed would be the right uh, style and paradigm for developing these these worlds. Uh, VR chat. Um, <laughs> And I mean, you can see here also, there's various ways of inputting, full body scanning, there's finger scanning or if, and full on headsets, but now headsets already have transparency. If you are with some people together, I mean, I don't, my paradigm is not that you are isolated in, in your cave at home, but that you with the group in real life, then being surrounded by windows and surfaces into the virtual world and you have presencing of others in your space. So it's a different model than, you know, 100 isolated individuals in their, in their bedrooms meeting in the fantasy world. It's something different. Anyway, Somnium Space has these kind of, um, I mean, yeah, clubbing, then you can have a fantasy outfit and you can approach somebody. You know, once you've reached certain proximity, you know, you can use voice message. And you can hear what somebody's telling you and so on. <laughs> Anyway, so I've, I'm, I'm selecting many of these. I mean, we had Theo's birthday was on, on Mozilla Hubs, uh, uh, Hubs for Mozilla a celebration. I don't know, it looked like that. Um, I had Sansa before. Let me, so I mean, so I'm just, you know, if you enter this market, you, we got to study what's out there. And of course, what's out there is, at the moment, I'm still in the entertainment world uh, aspect, where there is, which is most advanced. So, and where, where this is good, because playful exploration of technologies where the burden of high performance isn't on yet, that's the way these things get developed. So it's, it's quite natural that a lot of these techniques, um, you know, get perfected and invested in, in play worlds. And um, so they're not yet kind of performance critical and people have time, they can, they can get into it. Um, so this is big screen where you can watch a movie together with friends. But you can see architecturally, it's either kind of some stupid fantasy design or something very ordinary. Um, there's so many. I mean, it's VR chat I had before. There's a different one. I don't know if I want to talk to somebody like that. <laughs> so, uh, but there's also the NBA. I mean, recently because of the, the COVID, I mean, event venues and event 
and entertainment firms had to be creative. So they have this kind of virtual participation, B, BT Sport, you can also participate, you know, be virtually in a stadium. So we got a leap forward and we're getting a lot of technology development as well in terms of the headset, the finger tracking. And I don't have it all here, but also there's, um, and some of these hardware people are also getting into developing the, the spaces and to, to push their, and try their, 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 what their hardware delivers to them. There's plenty, and now we're moving into, with that we're already moving into more professional, let's say, world settings, tasks. Biz reality is, you know, conferencing around the trade fair. Of course, it's easy to place, you know, your industrial design models as virtual models, uh, which you can kind of go to, click on, swivel around and so on and and then you know draw information out i mean that's an, an, a non-starter and then you can have a world where you have where you allow companies to to set up their stalls and then there may be hire an architect to design a stall or you have the system i'll give you some modules and components product presentations I mean, everything is, and we ourselves got into this. We have the VR lab, and, and uh, we have actually now three teams, research teams, going into the VR uh, cyber space. It's it's this kind of a traditional VR team we had, and they created this kind of um, a stock trading uh, a VR kind of tool. And we've done a number of other things in, in, with that. And we have, of course, Shadjay's team, as well as uh, my kind of uh, life processing and agent-based uh, research team is shifting into that. Presentations uh, is kind of, let's say, two and a half D uh, version. And um, this is an interesting one. It's a conferencing where you can do the networking. You can have your books, you know, your stalls, your posters, your after lecture networking and after party. And uh, it's it's a kind of strangely <laughs> lecture halls and everything set into a. <laughs> it is. It looks like a toy world, and of course, you could potentially fly over overview. Uh, and avatars are funny, and you're in the, in the Alps somewhere. Um, there are many of those uh, uh, coming up. So we're just studying this. Meeting VI is quite interesting. They kind of, they must have looked at some of our work in terms of the way they designed their spaces. And this, is, it, this reminds me of our, our museum in, in, um, in North Italy. But this is, uh, you know, it, it, they have a number of, they thought through quite a number of different types of interactions and specialized spaces for different types of meeting, conferences, lectures, brainstorming sessions. And um, I'll just go quicker through that. It's called Meet in VR. And there is, uh, you can do it with the headset, you can do it with the, uh, you know, iPad, etc. I mean, I don't have time to go through all of them here. Um, and, you know, different types of workspaces, meeting, it's smaller intimate meeting, brainstorming, where you're just standing, the lecture halls, and you see the design is quite funny and interesting. Um, and then that sometimes it's also quite, quite ordinary and simulating a kind of some, some average space. Now, Glue, I mean, there's just VA spatial, um, spatial IO is, is, is then also inviting you, you use your, you, you kind of this kind of AR overlay onto, uh, in a shared physical space. Um, obviously, you wear these, um, uh, was it called either the Google glasses or Facebook glasses or um, Microsoft glasses? I mean, there's different ways of presencing um, 
virtual content into the real space. And that's what was interesting. I mean, there's also, you could project, obviously, not just look at a laptop screen, but you, you could project, you know, whole walls. And there are some examples of all four walls or panoramic immersive projections, which is the virtual world, windows into the virtual world. You can also have these kind of holographic representations. And actually, I don't have that here. Microsoft is working on robots. Uh, lightweight robots uh, standing height of a person where you remotely control the robots, you can roam around in the building and your face and video is projected and you can roam around as an you know, avatar <laughs> and talk to people. And, uh, you know, of course there's motion tracking and um, you know, in various ways of um, presencing yourself into the virtual. <laughs> and uh, my students are working on this and one of them, well, and there's various ways of, 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 of these AR overlays. Now the most extreme one is of course, it's a bit expensive, but inspired by this Microsoft idea, you could also be represented and roam around, you know, maybe if, you know, a wealthy person could do that. You have a hundred of those and you're in a hundred, you know, in, in, in each city you can, you can, you can uh, roam around and, and, and get yourself represented. But I think the Microsoft thing is interesting uh, because it's a very minimal little, little uh, uh, stick with a screen and you, you get cameras, of course, so you can see and approach people, talk to them, etc. This is another thing where you have these, the possibility, of course, to have co-creation, co-creative collaboration in, in these ways. Anyway, uh, finally I want to show um, Space Popular as a kind of AA unit in the diploma school and they're also the, 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 the two uh, principals and teachers. They also create these events. This was actually a conference which, they, which was IKEA 2020, which was, had to be virtual and they made the virtual Instantiation. It was interesting here that you have this kind of funny toy town, I, you know, graphic implementation. It doesn't need to be photorealistic, uh, of course. And it could be quite otherwise, but but it's still spatial. So, <laughs> legible information reminds the select orientation, navigation, and later I would say interaction. That's the task, whether it's in, whether we're talking about physical environments or, or virtual environments. In the future, we'll talk about this fusion, that mixed mode integration of interaction with some physically co-present and then not in a series of other participants coming in remotely as groups as well or as individuals. And that's the task which I'm starting right now. Um, but also there could be a whole um, world where these, I mean, like Decentraland, where you say maybe there might be multiple cities, particular topic based or you know the Google world, where you have not just one building, one kind of set of spaces, but in the end it becomes an urban condition. So we need to look at urban orders for kind of cyber urban <laughs> urbanism. And I'm just, I don't wanna go too much into the kind of lot we've learned through, through urban ordering, you know, axis sequences, grids, the condition of overlap, blurred boundaries, all that we've learned as we moved along the history um, uh, in terms of networks and fluid and open networks and differentiating identities, all of this is relevant, the whole history of architecture uh, and where we've reached in terms of parametric urbanism um, is relevant to have that cyber urban district <laughs> Um, uh, delivered with the most intricate, let's say, uh, information, act, action, activity, and information density, and maintaining legibility in the face of complexity and versatility and density. So I'm just rehearsing, you know, uh, and I'm inviting myself and others to reflect upon. And it could be also multi-author uh, urbanism, like the metaphor of the ecology of multiple species of different firms coming into that 
and hopefully the various designers uh, interact and strike up connection resonances like you would when you come into a city and you want to you choose a location because there's lots of interesting neighbors you want to be connected up and also be affiliated iconographically similar to many of them and that's the kind of idea where what we've done in recently in DRL could also be in reinterpreted as an as an a um, cyber urban condition. So I'm now talking about the cyber urban incubator, which is uh, not a whole district, but maybe a cluster of buildings or you know a startup cluster. Uh, because we're doing some of those projects, I think they would be ideal to, you know, particularly if you're talking tech uh, companies, they're tech savvy, then they would be able to understand what we're trying to do. And uh, so some of these projects which we're doing could be launched initially as VR experience, where you can already start using them, learning, uh, and, and, and also letting them out and finding various tenants, find each other and start networking each other with each other. So this is reinterpreting basically these kind of incubator, um, incubator projects. You can see what the way we develop them complex, integrating across different sites, integrating public spaces, outdoor spaces, but also having a lot of kinetic transformability, which is easy to deliver in, in cyberspace. In real space, we have a lot of screens already at that. And then we are simulating interaction. Uh, and that we could also obviously simulate avatar interaction. And we can also imagine that when we, when we, that we are, when we are, uh, part of an institution, the firm, we let our avatar represent us and roam around and collect messages and behave in similar ways to we behave. So we have these spaces not empty. Some of them are in the simulations of ourselves. Some of them are some really virtual instantiations and sometimes we are really showing up. Anyway, I'm just showing these projects, DRL projects of recent, um, Yes, when I mean, you can see that what we've always done is framing social interactions through morphology, through color coding and so on. And we're always looking at uh, furnishings and buildings and spaces and, 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 and path and together with the, with, the, um, with the populations and events unfolding within them. So I'm proposing in a way that yes, such buildings should be built and they should be digital twins or with expansions, maybe more sophisticated, more fluid, uh, virtual versions. Uh, and when you join the virtual version, you actually project it into the real space. When in the real space, you project it into the virtual version and you get that fusion. And imagine a lot of surfaces being screens uh, or everybody's wear, wearing as well uh, Google or Facebook glasses. And uh, we're getting this kind of interesting fusion because we know that we are going, we're not going to all come back 100% of the time. And there will be people co located physically, and then we some want to join remotely. So, you know, and of course, you could do that through various ways of you know, having a robot roaming around, projecting your holographic projections in particular spaces, very ambitious, or this through AR overlays or through surround screens, panoramic screens, where one space is extended through a wall into a virtual space. I don't have to go through all of them here. And uh, some of these older projects, which were this semiological project, uh, where you had um, a vocabulary, and the grammar and the vocabulary includes, uh, you know, distinctions like unbound versus bound space for the kind of public circulation and leisure spaces unbound to the, then a series of bound spaces, but then there are two types, uh, the, the work zones and the meeting zones as business spaces, bound spaces, uh, you know, convex or concave, each of them parametrically variable. And then you can also have an in-betweening between the two types because there's something where you, it's not individualized work. It's not kind of 
a specialized meeting, but a kind of workshop situation where you meet and work at the same time. So there's gradients, variation, and then there is clustering of those where you can see how they nest with each other, how the, the grammar works if you make a composite um, larger structure out of the individual meanings and the meaning makes sense. So you can also overlap to workspace and generate a third workspace. You overlap to workspaces and generate a meeting space or meeting in a workspace, generate the meeting space. So things like overlap and gradients, the kind of parametric semiology. And then you can instantiate that and you have a gradient of overall from bound to unbound. You have kinetic transformation, you have color coding, and you have a repeating of the overall space form, the workspace is a convex space, and the table form picks that up in detail, the colors, the shapes, the meeting space is convex, the working space is uh, uh, concave, I mean, the, and so is the table, so is other elements of the space. So you get a consistent, and then you get something where, the, where you have a, blur, a strict boundary or blurred boundary, nothing is ever a kind of rigid wall. So this is a, let's say, a, spa a spatio-visual language with a syntax, a semantics, rules of grammar, a vocabulary. And I think you can, that is just, you know, let's say that the, the, the parametrism as we known it and learned it with, let's say, with nerve surfaces in Maya, but we obviously can also and should implement tectonism, where you get the much richer types of surface, not all nerve surfaces, you have minimalist surface and tensile structures, you have these catenary uh, forms. Um, when you have compression structures, you, 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 you get different uh, materialities, you get active bending, curved folding, and they all have different character and recognizability, and then they can instantiate in different materials. And you can have these kind of pavilions. These are the pavilions of, of Achimengis. You can, you, can, you can have material similarity and let's say geometric contrast, or you can have geometric similarity and material contrast. So, you, so each of these is similar um, um, <laughs> um, and dissimilar at the same time with others. So there's similarity and contrast because that means you're in a complex network of what I call similitudes and contrast. And that's also the way the social world is ordered. You are similar with other people and you just have certain contrasts. You're grouped with different ways. You're not always part of one group. You, you group with, with different situations. Spaces are grouped along different axes and you could articulate that. And basically what is also beautiful about this, it's more rich and varied and you get less monotony in the overall complex. If you think about a very large Google complex and you do only nerve surface in gray or white, it's not viable. Anyway, so, so I'm just, of course we have to then, uh, that's the semiology part, operationalize it. What does it mean, these different situations, spaces, characters, colors, forms? They mean different behaviors, different purposes, where you gather, where you flow, where you move, where you chat, where you don't chat, and, and, and who is accessible, et cetera. And I don't want to go into too much detail. Of course, that's the whole research project we've been doing at, uh, uh, with my PhDs and with the uh, Zadi Research Group and with Tyson and Sungman and so on. And this uh, is the way we're also testing our own environment. And you can simulate. Um, how to maximize encounters, how to maximize interactions. And that could also, of course, apply to virtual environments. And we can simulate virtual interactions as much as real interaction. And in the end, we can simulate the overlay of virtual and real. So, and we've, if we've done obviously a lot in that space and we're doing the big technology centers and we've done the, the we've done the full on 3D models, and we actually have already the full VR representations and the agent-based simulations in a lot of these buildings. So we're actually ready to say to the client, "Hey, this building is going to be finished in five years. Let's launch the virtual version, kind of in one year or in half a year, and you can already 
experience it or the use it. You can already let out and sell your various units. I mean, this is a, it's all a corporate for one for one client at Spurbank. But so 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 I think we we're ready to. And then you can make extensions which are more fanciful and purely virtual, where you move in into and um, into uh, and later on they have a parallel existence. So that's the the vision, the idea. And so we're talking about to clients at the moment, and you can obviously uh, experience this in various ways on the screens, on panoramic screens, on full-on headsets. We we are all ready for that. And and this is yeah, this is some of the VR stuff we <laughs> pure VR environments we've created. And, and and even if you go fanciful and otherworldly in some respects, they're not just digital twins, you could integrate them with this in the same style, language, iconography of that corporation. So at least there is a conceptual and um, corporate identity connection with the physical environment and partly a direct integration with the physical environment. Anyway, that's what we've done. Um, and we have obviously simulated these um, uh, spaces, we are optimizing them, and that's for the real world. But again, the same techniques <laughs> applicable for the virtual world. And you know that in web design, you have much more easier tracking of who is where and charting and 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 um, uh, you can also get feedback and ask for feedback. And so some of these simulations we've generated, um, we, we show you actually the client and saying, hey, we have a virtual environment for you. And um, and so we have so many of those clients, you know, this is Sperbank, this is Infinitus and they're corporates, which, what we're talking about here applies to all of them. And uh, they have hundreds and thousands of employees which need to be, you know, somehow grasped in their interactions need to be tracked and optimized. And these things are under construction. So what we've done, I mean, Tyson and his team, they have done uh, a digital twin of our Beijing office already. And you can already, um, we join and go there and meet colleagues and watch, you know, a presentation together and have a chat on the side. Um, we just made this kind of better version test. Um, and so there's also, yeah, so, so maybe in, in the end you get the real and then the virtual extension, but we have that. And you can, you have the avatar, you can project your video on top of each other, you can approach each other, talk to each other. Um, and so that's what one can offer. I mean, in this case, it exists already, but, you know, I haven't been in Beijing for, you know, over a year because I can't travel. But the nice thing is here, you can, you can launch it, you know, several years before the real building is coming, and then you can learn it and maybe adapt it and later on, it has a parallel life. And of course, we're thinking through at the moment that instead of having just a TV screen here, we will have many more, um, let's say, surfaces and devices, and in particular occasions, full-on holographic projections. So maybe the boss gets always, you know, appears in a certain space and gets a full-on holographic uh, representation of himself. Um, anyway, so, so that's happening as we speak. Uh, in our virtual Beijing office. <laughs> um, so, and I'm just showing you some of the projects where I think we could do these virtual. We, at the moment, we, we're building all of that. Only this one is actually built so far. We got a new one, the Chongqing Unicorn. These are all incubator spaces. And um, we have many of those in China. And you know, to some extent, they're eager on us. We're talking to Tens at the moment, and the the, the employee, uh, the uh, the developer, and they they get it. And I mean, the drone flying is one thing, but 
in virtual, you we, you know the drone fly mode will be a will be will be important. And we also is working starting on the retail, and we want to do smart retail. Um, a la Amazon, and we they're gonna be online. The shops who you know might have online parallel conditions on the whole mall is an online experience at the same time. So sorry, that's the pitch. That's the project. <laughs> and I think it's exciting, particular when we are saying that this is very closely connected to what we've been doing, and it will remain. The paradigm here is it's integral, seamless with the real architectures, even if it sometimes has its own kind of parallel life, it ties back with the design. And um, so it's not escaping architecture and it's one discourse, one um, design, more des uh, outlet for the design disciplines, a global firm like Zahadid will want to address because we want to, um, design the interfaces and framing all the communications anybody could have anywhere in whatever mode and, 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 and mood. And that's that's the task. And that means we also want to do the, not only the, the urbanism, we want to do the public spaces, we want to do the interiors, the furnishings, the the, the, the dresses potentially, and the, you know, we're doing the cutlery and we're doing the, now we're doing also the virtual interfacing and, 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 and not no longer graphics, the kind of 3D integration of that. So, because what I said is design is one of the great function systems of society. So it is totally all encompassing. So we as designers are exclusively, but at the same time, totally and wholly in charge of the totality of the phenomenal world. So wherever, whatever you see, touch, feel, encounter, not the content, but the framing, the environmental framing is one of our colleagues. And now we are including landscape design as well. I mean, there's only very few places, raw nature somewhere <laughs> where you can escape this, but usually we don't. Usually wherever you do, whatever you touch is a colleague. And even if it's, you know, the packaging of your, of your sandwich with the, with the <laughs> it's, it's everything, is, is design uh, uh, and we should take that on and we should fully take on all the, um, the design of all the virtual interaction spaces. That's the pitch. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, thank you for the, for the amazing lecture. Uh, like super interesting to see how you're already I guess like for a couple of years already now, like uh, investigating the cyberspace is definitely very exciting now to see. I'm gonna collect like few questions. Um, maybe we do like, I don't know, five, six questions. We have people in YouTube. We have the students here. They also prepare some questions and I also have like a few of them. So maybe we just throw a few of them. Wait, I'll then, stop my sharing. How do I do that? Wait, let me see. Then I can see more of you guys, okay. Yeah. So maybe like kind of a bit connected to your presentation. Like I, I would like to throw like a first question to expand a little bit more on that. So I think like my question will be like on a virtual space. Like uh, of course I'm, I'm kind of like more, not sure if exactly a millennial, but like uh, close enough to them to have been playing video games. So I'm quite familiar with, with the virtual space. So like one, one question I would like to ask you is like, how, how do you envision like the organizing of the virtual space? Like basically in the physical world, we can limit the amount of conversations and the, the amount of social interactions just by the physical world itself. But then in a virtual world, everything is possible. Like everything can happen in parallel. So I think like uh, as architects, like we, we need to, very much think about like how we can organize and, and frame these conversations, or maybe not. Like maybe that's that's part of. No, the I think it's very important. You need you need to think about what is purposeful. You know, you you need degrees of seclusion. Uh, maybe what what you know, uh, you, but you need to have maybe an awareness of what the different things are going on, and some of them 
are quite open to let you enter. Maybe you just come in as a silent participator and uh, from, the, from the edge. And maybe there's a, you need an invitation to go deeper. I mean, just look at all these tools now, the recent clubhouse and so on. You, you can mm. come in and out, dip in and out. I mean, that's fine. And nobody worries about that. Mm. But you can also, for more intimate and secluded areas, you can, there's, there's kind of maybe uh, you have pre, you, you have um, been pre-screened or you have access codes and, and they should be become more intu intuitive there. You have, a, you have a kind of digital fingerprint, which, which, which gives you access to various things, subscription, mm -hmm. if it's an economic transaction. Um, but, but most, a lot of this, of course, um, competing for attention. So it, openness and open access would probably dominate in many of these scenarios. And it's also the way the physical world had kind of evolved mm. um, in terms of open and borderless kind of roaming around. And, you know, and it's not everywhere like this, unfortunately, but I think that's the spirit. And if it, if it becomes more come in Google, for instance, you can roam around the whole campus. It's, it's very, very open and connected open to the, to, the, to, the, to the urban fabric around it. And that's the spirit I, I foresee, of course, but there's structure. And that's what they do in these in these tools as well. I mean, you have you need certain you need to be in the same space. Then you start seeing, you 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 have a certain proximity. Then you can start saying something, and it is heard. Uh, maybe they should you know you should who you're orienting towards, mm -hmm. and uh, you know certain types of you know, or you just have to sit next to somebody, and and suddenly, uh, the you know maybe you know that 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 openness. Uh, and the, I mean, the, the interaction protocols um, will be developed together with clients. Mm -hmm. Now, the clients will tell you what kind of situations they want to create, um, the way they would brief us. Um, and then we would tell them how we implement. Uh, so what kind of iconography, so what kind of spatial organization with what kind of threshold where act, action possibilities adjust they, that's the kind of collaboration between those who in the end, the host mm -hmm. uh, and investors in, in, uh, in the uh, worrying really about the end user experience because it's their, it's attributed in the end to them. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I also have to reflect the, the communication. I mean, in the end, the event is attributed to those who are hope, to the client and not to the architect because most people are not aware who is the architect. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so the, that's coming from the client and we would be the experts in knowing and having lots of options how to articulate that and how to structure and order that uh, so that the client gets, so we need a much more complex briefing process. Um, somehow if these things become more complex, that's what you see with sophisticated clients, by the way. So when we do a head corporate headquarter, we get, you know, we talk to many of, you know, heads of departments and we know more about the internal processes to start getting into how we, I mean, BMW was very extensive, for instance, and others are like this as well. So, yeah, I mean, you, you're absolutely right. So that's become something which uh, in the virtual world will be similar, that not, not, not everything is, you know, just rampantly open for everybody. You need degrees of structuring and you can use distance for that. And, and the other thing is, which is interesting, you need, um, it's very helpful to, to rely on certain analogies and an analogical knowledge. So, so we all grew up and learned a lot of ways of interacting and recognizing different kinds of situations and spaces living in the real world. So if you can bring that into the virtual world, you get a lot of, uh, adv for free in a sense, a sense of competency and in a sense of recognizability. So, so that's in a sense also what the magazine analogy mm -hmm. was an important help. Mm -hmm. And then there's new things like a hyperlink, you can click and jump something else, it's a little disorienting and how can you go back? Um, but, but, but there was a solid base analogy you could rely on uh, one was uh, in terms of magazine pages and text and image and so on, headlines. And the other one was in the world of filing systems, mm -hmm. you know, folders and files and documents and lists. And, you know, so that was the world, you know, from the, the, the office 
I mean, that's what is called Microsoft Office. It's, it's some kind of, so we need these analogical transferences to, to bring along, let's say, recognizability and competencies. And the same is important with cyberspace that we bring along, um, you know, they're going too literal in many ways. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and we also need to more have you know, degrees of innovation. So I hope it's going to be the 21st century city and not based on the 19th century city. Mm -hmm. And it's based on climatism and not on, 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 on modernism when we're doing this. Mm -hmm. But we need to rely on these analogies to come through. So is there like for this kind of uh, cyberspace, uh, do you see them as kind of simulations of the physical world? Or do you think like this is gonna kind of well, in that's what a I'm competition with the physical world? There was initially, you can, I mean, some of them are very fantastical, but they're also, be, you know, they're, but they're relying on, let's say, fantasy comics and fantasy novels or these kind of things. Uh, um, so you need to build on something. You can't throw people into an abstract chaos, and nobody has the patience to learn something super strange mm -hmm. particular if this is you know um, um, you don't want to learn to new, new language Chinese before you fly to China I mean it's like uh, you know it's just not viable so so we got to build on you know but of course we, we, we there are also degrees of freedom you know where you where you don't you don't have these constraints so you can be more playful you can be other my particular idea is so, so yes there is uh, you need to uh, bring around these, you know, what, what's familiar and then inject interesting new, a number of important new innovations. In my case, what's particular as well, that I think we, we, I'm thinking of a lot of the clients we would build these spaces for, we're also building their, their real spaces. And it makes a lot of sense to connect those up. So mm -hmm. Apple stores, online store, that should be similar to Apple store, and it's aesthetically connected with the product, with the, with the architectures they have. And then you can play on that. In a similar, that's what I foresee. That's a particular offering here that we, we would be ones, we would have the advantage over the pure graphic web designers that, that we first of all bring that architectural analogy with us, but also that we probably, uh, that those clients will also need real estate. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there will be some clients that, that are purely virtual presences and then we, we could still bring something namely that strong uh, 3d uh, modeling and and imagining capacity uh, but most clients will also be we will have real architectures which we could we could develop and you see what I mean is because I believe that a lot and that's my focus is on the on the on the corporate world and on, on the work environments and uh, co-working and so on that we that we are this will not be an isolated experience so we don't it's not a virtual world where they said where 100 people they're all in their bedrooms but some of the people participating in the event will be actually together there physically and then they just need to be jo others joining in as individuals as a group so you get a kind of spatialized experience it's a bit like um so it's in this sense it's, it, i think i strongly believe that because i don't believe for instance when i'm talking about reflect our company that we will now work forever from home but i believe that a lot of the so we actually redesigning our facilities and making more interesting and sociable and so on and we will uh, re-enter the offices but not everybody and we'll have more satellite offices so we look at the mixed mode fusion of real and virtual and also believe that the virtual will not only be accessed in the future through handsets or small screens but really more immersive video walls or as i said holographic presentations not everywhere holographic mm -hmm. but important conditions like a lecturing position on a panel if you had a panel discussion you had three uh, physical presence and then you invite the famous speaker he should be there as a holographic because it's a fixed position, you can build up the whole apparatus and appear that person <laughs> but at the lectern, full on holograph, hologram. So that so it's going to be many different things. And then they and then there's an audience 
But then there's a virtual audience in a, in a, in a, in, you know, in a kind of full on video screen behind and you can also say something. And so, so that's the kind of thing you have to imagine that this transformation will not be only virtual worlds. It will be the, the whole interfacing will change. You know, body tracking continuous in real spaces so that you at the same time can observe by a virtual crowd uh, rather than camera feeds only. So be mixture of camera feeds, body scanning, uh, and, and you know, the, where you project it as avatar maybe in five different places while you walk around in the, in the, in the office. We have a, a question from, from Honduras, from Max Medina. Okay. So Max Medina says, uh, oh, yeah, I, Max. Hi, Max. See you. Say, like, uh, great to see you again virtually. And he's asking, uh, uh, what, what do you think about political aspects? Uh, let me rephrase the question. What did you think about the political aspects can interfere in the cyberspaces? Liberty is going to be preserved? It's a big problem. It's a big issue. It's interesting. Um, I mean, we, we, we're facing it right now. We, would love, you know, we can suddenly realize we have at AA, we're having students from around the world. It's all virtual and they, they don't need visas. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we can have good experience, but as you know, but then the question: mm, Can they just work right afterwards? How would that work? Wouldn't it, you know? Why would they need a visa? They just join our you know, anyway, virtual <laughs> office, uh, you know, and and this. Well, they are they have obviously political barriers right there, where uh, and there there could be many others uh, where I think. Um, this world will be censored and will be controlled and, and um, in particular as it moves away from entertainment into, into real, I think it will be, a lot of things will be, will be upsetting. But what comes to my mind, first of all, is employment law because um, if somebody's sitting in a different part of the planet, I mean, um, is it really, in, and of course, I mean, they, we could have different mechanisms now. We could use them consultancy mechanisms, agencies and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's, it would open up a lot if that, um, that um, collaborative co-presence is more globalized. What that means for politically is interesting. And there are many other political questions, of course. Um, it's an interesting one. I mean, I'm, I'm always uh, hoping for maximum freedom, in particular at that stage where we have to explore a lot, a lot of experiment with a lot. And there shouldn't be somebody saying, well, that's risky or this could be offensive or this is, will be abused in the future if we don't clamp down now. And, you know, avatars, I don't know if there's kind of anti-nudity and pornography or obscenity laws already in the world of avatar self-styling. I mean, you, you're not allowed to walk, you know, naked into, uh, into the street. I don't know if you're allowed to walk in, in inverted commas. Uh, uh, <laughs> Naked into 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 a public. Um, um, I mean, I would hope for maximum freedom uh, to at least explore what's poss possible because that's that's the kind of um, <laughs> the exploration phase where where the um, where we should keep you know worry less, try more. Mm -hmm. We have one of the students asking uh, about uh, about C. Um, uh, what can we? So, semiological spaces in the cyberspace, and whether we could also think about them not in enclosed, fixed space, but more like in open urban environments. Yeah, absolutely. I think first of all, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, the close. You saw this kind of t um, enclosure is more of a visual concept. I mean, the the the. the there's this company, Conferomatic, I showed you the conferencing, it was all in the open sky, Alps, mm -hmm. you know, so virtually. But also I was thinking, I mean, yes, in terms of, you think about something like a Times Square or Piccadilly Circus, where you have, you know, full facades becoming media face interfaces, and you have all these lighting grids over in China, you have sometimes a whole skyline, the dot matrix of, you know, I mean, these, these potentials are quite striking where we can utilize this media infusion in the urban as well and, uh, and have that, you know, have, have, have some, some interesting representation of 
the communication also, because I think it's also this, I mean, yeah, you, you, because the, the great thing about urban space, as I sometimes say, it's a 360 degree interface of communication. You have some things you concentrate on, but there's many things in the background which you might or might not see even, which is in the peripheral vision, which is in the layers behind, but which might interest you. And you couldn't have it on a flat, on a, on, a, on a 2D screen. You have to limit the 2D screen to kind of 15 things or out there, there. But we have this idea of hierarchy, you know, you see, you know, um, and, and depth vision where you, where, which helps you to structure your attention which is difficult to reproduce on and you can have you turn your head and you scan and you pick up more things and then your focus and your focus shifts so you you, you can kind of sense in 3d space you can in a sense orient with a, within a much more richer informational field yeah. because you have that structure of distance and, and layeredness and you know one thing being obscured by another and so on. Mm. so I mean, this is a bit more like a, I guess, like general question that you, you are involved in million things in parallel. You're well known for that. But in general, like what are your next goals and challenges? Like, well, what, what, is, what is next for you? Well, well, this one is, you know, the side of incubator, I want to realize it. And as I said, we are, we are researching at an ADL and I'm learning about it and we're starting even to approach, I mean, we're doing these mock-ups so that to, to pull that off, I'd like to bring on a major client and and, and, and showcase this and and so that's that's uh, the immediate ambition on that. I mean, in general, the, um, with respect to the firm, uh, we are growing. You said 400. We now have 450 and growing because that's um, the expansion of that paradigm of parameters and tectonism into more arenas and to all larger scale projects, different domains of uh, urban life. That's quite important for me. And uh, also on the, the other hand, you know, a larger company, you, know, you can you get more resources to set up these specialized, let's say research teams, groups, uh, to, 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 to innovate, to connect up, to have special organs as it were for also for internal communication and so on. So that's what I like about large organizations. Um, and and so, so that's an ambition, well, let's say that in terms of corporate. In terms of uh, academic, yes, I'm working on, on you know, I have, I have too many things I want to do. <laughs> Volume three of the autopraises of a tectonism work. And I mean, in developing, ADL is developing beautifully. So this, this, this is a research project, which I hope will come to something. And Sharjah is working on something actually quite similar um, with, with the gamification of urban, urban development. Uh, not so much uh, with the cyber uh, urban infusion, but using, um, using mediated VR kind of representation as a tool, tool for participatory mm -hmm. advancement of the, of, the, of the build environment. Um, quite interesting. So, 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 and 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 Theo is also developing further the uh, the idea of um, robotically structured environments, and that's what I'm in, also interested in with, in terms of the kinetic robotic AI and uh, kind of empowered architectural agents, where you don't want to think about whether you have to, you know, open this or that or this or that window, switch on this or that light, or reconfigure furniture. You want to have a kind of thinking along learning, machine learning, machine intelligent uh, architectural systems. And that also will include now all the screens and windows into the virtual world. It becomes even more important that you don't have to switch on something. I mean, the remote control is a totally out of the question. These Sending you a link. <laughs> spring into existence. I don't, you know, you need, they need to be kind of, under, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it is much more intuitive and self, self kind of offering. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so, so that's, that's, that's the world which, which I think is, I'm, I'm amazed. And so AI is a huge topic. Mm -hmm. uh, there's many avenues in which this kind of hitting the discipline. So maybe just like, we don't want to take too much of your time, Patrick, like just maybe to conclude, like a thank you for, for your time. Really appreciate it. 
uh, maybe if you can just conclude giving some advice to to future well future i mean look the guys whoever in that in that in that workshop made the, made the right decision to invest in you know computational design skills and to to all, but but also to to then immediately try to their kind of facility improve facility as a designer to do something sophisticated beautiful and 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 well performing that competes well that's a great experience so to and but the thing is this investment in skills it's, it's the student your times as a student are absolutely precious because once you're thrown into a envi firm environment there yes there is a bit of training a little bit of extra time but uh, it's going to be hard to to catch up uh, you got to produce and and not uh, learn so mm -hmm. uh, you can, it's, it's lifelong learning of course but the, the basis you set now of course to on the one hand skill investment but on the other hand exercising a facility and projects thank you patrick okay thank you everyone thank you so much patrick thanks it's good to meet you guys and I hope that's uh, that, that that's been been productive. Take care, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.